Again, round of applause for DJ Mooster. Thank you. Awesome. Did you get your stuff back? I did. Thank you. Well, I didn't do it. What did I do? You came, you came by and, you know, like, you were the getaway driver. Do you not remember this? I mean, I, no, I'm saying I drove, but you did all the work. Okay. All right. That's true. Yeah. I mean. We're good? I'm still in the hospital, so I got to go pick him up. That, I know nothing about that. Okay. So let's keep it at that. You can pretend all you want. But. All right. No, legally, I have, to, I have to not know anything. Okay. All right. We're good. Uh, all right. Cool. So uh, in today's class, quickly, before we go over to the material, uh, for administrative stuff, um, for you guys, uh, homework two and project one will be out today. Uh, I'll go over project one in more detail on, on Thursday's class because it is based on what we're, talk about, what we're talking about on Thursday, um, some parts of it. And then uh, homework two will be due uh, before then, okay? And then P0 and homework one were due on Sunday night. All right? All right, cool. So. We've spent the last two classes talking about uh, database storage, and we talked about you know, the page-oriented architecture. We talked about the, 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 the log-structured ar architecture. We talked about what the values actually look like. Um, and so today's class, I want to spend a little time talking about ways to represent the data in a in maybe slightly different way to sort of target one class of workloads versus another. We've been sort of dancing around this idea of like, oh, there's these notions of some workloads want to do a lot of writes and a lot of updates to the database, and some workloads want to do a lot of reads. So I want to spend some time in the beginning just, just talking about what, what these sort of category of database workloads look like, and then we'll see that how we can design a, a storage architecture or the layout of data to take you know to be better for one approach versus another. So this is a gross oversimplification of, of what real applications look like. But usually, this is how people talk about you know, what database workloads look like in, in, in database world. So in, in, there's sort of three high-level categories. The first will be called OLTP, Online Transaction Processing. And these will be applications that have to do a lot of updates or do a lot of uh, writes to the database and also read some data as well. But typically, the amount of data that each individual query is going to access is going to be quite small. Right? So think of like you go to Amazon's website. What do you do? You put things in your cart. You make updates to your payment information. You buy things. Like you're doing stuff on your account. Right? So the amount of data, like the, the total amount of data might be quite large because there's obviously a lot of users in Amazon. But when you do stuff on Amazon, when you interact with the application, the queries that get invoked at, at the behest of what you're doing, those things don't touch a lot of, lot of data. The, uh, the next sort of uh, category is OLAP, online, trans online analytical processing. So these are now the, when we think sort of data science, uh, business uh, intelligence, or uh, uh, data analysis, this is what these kind of workloads look like. So you're looking at not individual records, but large swaths of data, right? So again, think of Amazon. They don't care about, when in, their, in their OLAP queries, what individual item you bought. They want to look at things like, what was the most common bought item in, in Pittsburgh when the day, you know, you know, on, a, on a Sunday when it was raining? Right? They're trying to extrapolate new knowledge from uh, the existing database. And then so the, the, the last category here is sort, of, is a sort of marketing buzzword, but there is some truth to it. Um, these obviously, these, these sort of categories of workloads aren't always cleanly defined. Like, you know, you wouldn't say, oh, I can't do this because it's an OTB thing, or I can't do this because it's an OLAP thing. Some cases, yes, but sometimes often people want to do analytical queries where they do their transactions, or do their transactions where they do analytical queries. And so this is sometimes called HTAP. It's like a, it's like a business. Uh, uh, there's, this, there's this marketing firm or business analyst firm called uh, Gartner, and they put out a lot of these buzzwords. Sometimes they stick, sometimes they don't. HTAP seems to stick. So sometimes you'll see databases claim themselves there's HTAP because they want to be able to do fast transactions and do analytics at the same time. Right? Another way to think about it is on a spectrum like this. Uh, so along the y-axis, you would say the, the Operation complexity or complexity of the query, right? Is it like simple things like go get one record, or is it doing you know multiple joins, doing aggregations, and so forth? And then the on the x-axis, we say the workload focus is the workload going to be write-heavy versus read-heavy. Um, so you can sort of think of this division line here, where you have OTP at the bottom, where they're going to have uh, a lot of writes, uh, but they're going to be more simple, and the queries themselves, the reads could be more simple as well. Then you have sort of OLAP up here, where you're not doing a lot of writes, but you're doing mostly reads, right? 
So OLAP is another one of these buzz terms, buzzwords, but like this is a good example where like somebody comes up with a buzzword in the past and then it just sort of becomes the, the, the common vernacular going forward. So OLAP was actually in, uh, coined by this guy, Jim Gray. Uh, he won the Turing Award for databases in, uh, in the 1990s. There's been four Turing Award winners for databases. Charles Bachman was the first one, uh, then Ted Codd, then Jim Gray. Anybody know the last one? You. Not me. <laughs> not me. Definitely not me. Oh, yeah. uh. <laughs> it's on the slide. Mike Stonebreaker. Right, the guy who invented Ingress, Postgres, Vertica, a bunch of different things, uh, who, who was one of my PhD advisors, uh, he won the Turing Award in 2014. Um, Anyway, so the story, this OLAP term, Jim Gray kind of got paid off by like, his company uh, in the 90s. It was like, hey, we got to think of a new term. Let's call it OLAP uh, for databases because they were trying to sell OLAP database. And he wrote an article. It's like, hey, here's this new category of workloads called OLAP. Then, got, then it got found out it got, he got paid uh, and they had to retract it. Uh, but the, the, the term stuck. Um, and so again, HTAP would be, sort of be in the middle here. Okay. So for this lecture here, we're really going to be focusing on the OLAP stuff. So really understand this, like, we're not trying to look at maybe individual records. We're trying to look at, you know, entire table scans and do joins across them, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second. We'll, we'll talk about later in the semester what joins are. All right, so going forward, let's use a really simple example of, of, a, of, a, of a database schema. And this is actually derived from the real uh, MediaWiki software. So this is basically, this is roughly what Wikipedia's, uh, uh, database actually looks like because it's open source. You, you can go get it. Um, and so you can see here you have, you have a user account table. You have pages, like the articles in Wikipedia. And then you have revisions. So you have a foreign key reference to the user that, that created the revision. And then you have a foreign key reference to the page that corresponds to like you know, the, the, you know, the original page, like the title and so forth. Right? And then for, uh, for I mean, a nice little thing that they do to make this thing run faster, because most people want to get just the, what's the current version or revision of a page, you can have another foreign key reference going back to say, for a given page, what's the latest version I should look at, right? rather than having to scan all of them. So the key thing to point out and, and remind you again what I said in the first lecture is that the relational model doesn't say anything about how a database system and the implementation of, of a database relational model system has to store the tuples on, on disk or, or in pages, right? And for, for the most part of this semester, or up, up until now, we've assumed that all the attributes or the values or the columns for a tuple will be stored together in, in a single page. We've talked about overflow pages, but we can ignore that for now, right? We just assume that somewhere in this like slotted page architecture or the log structure architecture, there'll be a starting point for a tuple and I'll have the first attribute followed by the second attribute and so forth. And then once I'm running out of attributes, then I switch to the next tuple. But this approach is, may not be actually the best way to store your database for some workloads. And the spoiler is it's going to be for OLAP workloads. So let, let's, let's see why. So for OLTP, again, these are where we're going to do uh, simple queries that are going to uh, read and write a small amount of data you know, per operation right, in, within the database. Again, think of like in Wikipedia, I want to go get the uh, the current ver revision for, you know, for a single page, right? Or I want to, I want to, someone logs in, I want to update the last login with, with the current timestamp and maybe the host name and when they logged in. Or they create a new re revision, and I'm just inserting all the attributes together for that, for that new tuple, right? And so th it's a side comment, I say, I say this is like, for most of you people like, hey, I think I want to build a startup or I have, I have a startup idea. This is, you, you typically build an OTP system first or OTP application first. Right, because you don't have any data to, to analyze, right? So there's nothing, nothing to do analysis, analysis on. You don't need OLAP. You build this first, so you can start ingesting new data. That's typically how it goes. I guess the spoiler has to be, my answer is, if you ask me what database should I use in my startup, the answer is going to be Postgres, okay? We can talk about why later. All right, so now for OLAP, again, these are going to be complex queries. They're going to be larger portions of data uh, that are going to try to extrapolate new you know, new information from the existing database data you've already collected, right? So in this query here, we're actually trying to get the, uh, the count, the number of people that have logged in uh, where their host name ends with um, .gov. So this is like maybe 20 years ago in the 2000s or so, um, there was like you know, congressmen or congresspeople 
there's people in, in the US government, they would pay the, their staff to go update the Wikipedia pages to be more flattering, right? Like propaganda BS. Right? So this query would basically find out all the people that have logged in with a, you know, on, a government, uh, on, on, on a government computer, right? So again, what are we doing here? We're trying to look at the entire table the, of user accounts and look at, you know, examine the, the logged in or host name one by one, right? So the way the DB system is going to represent tuples uh, is going to be referred to as a, as a storage model. And up until now, as I said, we've been assuming what is called a n-ary storage or a row storage model, where the, 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 the attributes, the bits for the attributes for a single record are stored contiguously one after another. Right? And this is ideal for OLTP workloads because, again, most of the queries are like, go get the data for mo this single record or go get the data for this single entity in the database. And therefore, I'm very likely going to need all or most of the columns. And therefore, if they're packed together on that page, then it's one disk read to go get the, the page that has all the data. I suck that into memory, and I have everything I need to process that query. And things are great. Right? So if I go to my example here, uh, say this is, my, this is our page. Uh, and again, we have some header that says this is the this, this starting point with the tuple. And then I don't go to the next tuple until I have all the attributes listed, right? And this doesn't matter whether it's log structured or, or the slotted page architecture. They, they both work roughly the same way. All right, so now if then I have this in a single page like this on disk with amongst a bunch of other pages. So when I have my query comes along that says select the, uh, the user account with a given username and password, I can use some kind of index data structure. We have like, we'll talk about that, what they are next week or in a couple weeks. Um, again, think of this as a glossary of what the, the, the you know, for a given uh, like attribute, like the username, go find, go tell me the, the page number and offset where it's located. And again, we'll cover this in lecture eight. And so using this index, we, we've identified that the record we need is just in this one page. We go bring that to memory, and then our query that knows how to jump to the right offset to find the data I need. And I just, since it's a select star query, I need all the attributes for this, for the user account record. I just read all the bits off at that offset, and I have everything I need, right? Things are great. Right, this is why the, for OLTP, the row storage architecture or the NSM approach storage model is going to be better or, or ideal. Well, let's uh, same thing for insert. We use a slot page architecture to find the next free slot, and then we just insert it there. We're good to go. But let's look at this, the query again. We were trying to count the number of people that have logged in per month at a, at a government email address, right? What pages am I going to need to touch for this? Well, I mean, th thinking more low level, like I have six pages, right, for this query. Like in the last one here, I only need to touch this one here. Right. This one here, what pages do I need to touch? All pages. All pages, exactly right. Because it's, again, it, it's just, we're scanning the entire table uh, just to look at every single record. All right, so now say, for, uh, so we'll ignore how we actually bring in one page at a time and so forth, right? Because to say it's just iterating one by one. So we start with this page here. We bring this into memory. Uh, we see here where in the where clause we have a host name for the user account. So we just need to look at this attribute here. And we look at one tuple at a time and do our, do our analysis. The, uh, in the aggregation, we're doing a count on last login and we're doing uh, to convert it into you know, per, per month. So for that portion of the query, I'm not saying what, how we execute the query just yet, but we know we need this data, right? Because we see the name. So we only need to look at this attribute, right? So that means all this other stuff here is useless data for this query. But we had to bring it in because it's in the page, right? We said that the pages are, the database pages are, you know, going to be block, you know, block oriented. So it could be four kilobytes, eight, 16, whatever. And we, so we can't tell the hardware, hey, magically, uh, go only bring in this, this slice of data here because the hardware doesn't know anything about the database. Right? It doesn't know what the contents of the pages are. So we had to go fetch this entire page, let's say 16 kilobytes, even though we only need uh, this portion of it. Right? So that's wasted disk I.O. because we brought things in we don't need for this query. So the advantage of the NSM approach, the row storage approach, is it's great for inserts, updates, and deletes when you need, when you have queries that need all the attributes, all the values, or almost all the values. Uh, within a tuple. 
but it's not going to be good for my example I just showed where we're doing large scans uh, that only need a portion of the attributes within the table. Yes? I have a related question so far. In every storage model, do we assume that the index that we have that matches the uh, tuple to the, uh, the page offset, is that always based on the primary attribute, or can that be customized based on what kind of queries we expect to receive? So this question is, uh, for this example here, I have an index. Do I assume that this is just the primary key index? Or could this be an index that, like, on s any arbitrary attributes? These, those would be called secondary indexes. If they're arbitrary, if they're not the primary key index, they're a secondary index. The answer is, the answer is, it could be. It doesn't matter, right? Because even for my, again, going back to my this example here, even if I had an index on uh, host on host name uh, to do that match, I gotta go get the the last login for it as well, so I gotta fetch that in. But you wouldn't have to read all the pages. Uh, so the statement is you wouldn't have to read all pages, yes, but it doesn't solve this problem here where I have useless data that I need. That problem yes. Okay. Now there's another way to, to there, is, there is what is called, you could build an index on host name and last login, only do the lookup on host name. Now you're, 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 you're uh, when you get to the leaf pages of the tree, now you also magically have last login there and you can use that. Those are called covering indexes. We will discuss them in a few weeks, right? There'll be other disadvantages of that approach versus, versus what the, the alternative is to the row store. Uh, sorry, the, 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 this other storage model will be better than that index approach. But that's, one, that's another way to get around this problem. OK. So for anybody here, maybe you've already heard, you already know the solution, because th this is pretty common now. What's what's another approach to doing this? What's another way to get around the row store problem? Yes. Like, I remember some parquet files do like column based. So he says he says there's some parquet files that do column based. Who here knows what parquet is? Right, like less than five percent. So the answer is yes. But what is, what does that mean though? Ignore parquet. What what does the what does that column mean? Stuff mean? So it just means that instead of skipping, you store one attribute, the one all the elements of one attribute in a page, I guess. Yes. So he's exactly right. Again, ignore, par ignore Parquet. We can cover. Parquet is basically a, a, a database file format that's independent of a database. So, like, you know, MySQL, SQLite, the bus tub, it has a proprietary file format that, like, only that one database can read. There's open source formats where, uh, like, other systems, you know, different systems can read the same sort of file format. All right. So, what he said is, and what the answer is, is, that, is column store or decomposition storage model. Where we're just going to sort of pivot or flip the, the, the architecture of the system, where instead of thinking about individual rows and storing them contiguously, we're going to think the database, think about the database or a table in terms of columns. And now we're, we're going to store all the values within a single column or attribute across multiple tuples contiguously one after another. Right? And this would be ideal for OLAP workloads where we have to do large scans over, over, over the entire table, and we only need a subset of the columns. Because now when we go fetch a page, potentially all the data in that page could just be for that one column that we, we, we would need. All right, so we go back here. Again, this is the row store approach. Uh, again, where the, the data stored contiguously one after another. All right, so it's, say we now break it up into columns across multiple, across multiple attributes. And then we store them, the values within that single column, one after another. Right, so now within a single page, in my example here, I only contain the values for the host name field. Yes? So if you have like certain pages to one column, certain pages to another one, but then each one like splits up, like for instance, okay, maybe the first 10,000 rows of this column go here, next 10,000 go into this one, does each different like collection of pages partition the rows the same? So your question is, is, is each collection of the? Like, let, let, let's say, like, let's say like, the attributes, there's just too many of them to fit in one page. Let's say you need like 10 pages yes. to fit all the values of in one attribute. But then you need, similarly, you need 10 more pages to fit all the values of the second attribute. Yes. Do they partition the rows the same way? Or are they lined what, up? Like, what, what, so, we, so, we, so the word partition is the one I'm getting tripped up on, because that means something very specific in databases. What do you mean? Same way. 
All right, so, all right, so his question is, uh, for a given tuple, uh, sorry, for a given attribute, uh, would the, if it takes 10 pages to store this one attribute, but if I could store another attribute in six pages, would I still have to allocate 10 pages for that? And th therefore, like, so that tuple one in this column fits, is on page two, and tuple one in, in this column is on, also on page two. So I'm like, no, they're independent. Because they could be different, the, the cause they could be different sizes. We'll talk about how you actually stitch this back together in a second, but uh, it, do, it doesn't matter. Less is better. Yes. I just realized that I'm a bit confused. Now that you showed me this, I, I'm a bit confused about how do I get a particular. So now that it's how do you get what? Sorry. How do I get a particular like, uh, like item? Like specifically, if I want the host name of a particular row, how do I get back right out? Okay. So so his question is, how do I identify an exact row if I need to stitch it back together? A few more slides. We'll get there. Yes. All right, any other questions? All right, so my simple example here, assume that all the values for a, uh, sort of, you know, for all the tuples for a single column can fit on each on the individual page, right? To, to his point here, it usually, it, you know, it never does. Uh, but for simplicity, we can assume that's the case, right? So now if we go back to the query we had before, uh, trying to get all the logins for, from government addresses and, and doing aggregation based on the, the month, Right, so I only need to touch two pages. So the first time, the first page I'll go grab is the host name. I rip through that, do my where clause. Uh, then I'm going to identify which tuples match at which offset, or which identifier m matches. And then I now I only need to go fetch the other page, uh, and know how to jump accordingly to the to the to the tuples that matched in the in the first where clause, and go use that to compute my aggregation. Yes. So his statement is, uh, his question is, is this just better because the cost of the cost of the the, the reduced the reduction in the amount of I/O is is so significant that it that it doesn't matter that there's overhead of doing the matching. Yeah, the, the matching's cheap. The matching's cheap. I'll say I'll say why in a second. Yeah, matching's easy. <laughs> but his answer is, the answer is actually is it's. It, this is going to have so many different other advantages, not just the reduce I/O. The second half of this lecture is also about compression, right? But it sort of becomes now obvious, right? Like why we're going to be able to get great compression because now all the values within or the data within a single page are going to be within roughly the, the same domain, right? Just think of like uh, if I have an age column, right? You know, nobody is a million years old. Everybody's going to be what, what zero to one hundred twenty, and so. The, that's a really small domain of values, and I can compress the hell out of that. So not only am I going to get uh, reduced I/O from just only getting the data that I need, but when I bring in data now from from disk, the amount of uh, utility that I'll be able to get from it is going to be quite significant. All right. So to, to answer his question, which he, which he brought up a good point, is how do we actually stitch things back together, right? Because even though I said most of the queries are going to run in OLAP systems or OLAP workloads are going to be, you know, doing full full table scans, you probably want to say, you know, what is Andy's bank account or go get Andy's single record. You still want to be, we still want to be able to do that. So there's two design choices for this approach, or to, to do this in a uh, in a column store, a DSM. The first is to use fixed length offsets, where you know that the value at a given offset in this column will match to another value in another, another column at the same offset. And they would correspond to the same tuple. And therefore, that means every single value within the column is going to have to be the same length. So that I can do simple arithmetic, like, oh, I want the millionth tuple. It's 32-bit integers. So, so 1 million times 32 bits, I, I jump to the offset that I want. Right? The other approach that's le not very common uh, in this shows up, there's one or two systems that do this approach. I forget who they are. It's, most systems do this, because this is the better way to do this. But you can also embed like an ID and have like a sort of lookup table to say, OK, if I, want, if I want tuple four, tell me what offset do I need to jump to within each different column. It's more overhead. You could do it this way. Some do, but most don't. Yes? The statement is, if you have variable length attributes and then it doesn't work, 
We'll solve that in a few more slides. Yes. Absolutely, yes. Yes. Wouldn't offsets just naturally be faster because it's just a quick calculation as opposed to this one? You have to still find which page contains the correct ID. So his, his statement is, and he's correct, that this is clearly faster because it's just simple arithmetic to go jump to the right offset, where this one you have to do another lookup to go get it. Yes, that's why nobody really does this way. I forget why the systems do this for historical reasons. It's, it's, it's not that common. Yes? But wouldn't, 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 doing that, wouldn't doing offsets means that deleting and like deleting and modifying is very difficult? So the statement is, if you're doing offsets, does this, does this mean that doing, say, deletes? Doesn't this make deletes harder? Absolutely yes. But what did I say in the beginning? OLAP workloads are read mostly, right? So, so most of the time, I'm trying to you know, optimize the system for the common case. Yeah, some rando can show up and delete stuff, but like how often does that happen versus a bunch of scan queries? So I want to optimize for the common case. Now, the way you can handle then de the deletes is you could have a, almost like the log structure stuff we talked about before. You could have a little buffer area say, okay, by the way, I deleted this offset, deleted that offset. And at some later point, you can do compaction and, and prune them out, right? Okay, so the advantages of the, um, of the column store approach and the DSM approach is that we're going to reduce the amount of, of I.O. because we only need to read exactly the data that we need. Again, this is another advantage of a declarative query language like SQL because the, the data system can look and say, oh, you're touching these columns. Right? There's no eval statement like in Python where you have to run the thing first to figure out what it's actually going to touch. You have to tell it up front what, you, what data you want to access. So we can use that information to only grab the pages that has the columns that we need from disk, right? And then there'll be, uh, you can get better compression and query processing uh, because it's now oh, so it's in this columnar format, which we'll cover uh, uh, in the second half of today. And the downside is what he brought up where this is obviously going to be much slower for, uh, for inserts, updates, and deletes, especially if the data is potentially sorted already, pre-sorted. Uh, because you have to you know, split things up, put things back together. OK? So this idea is not new. Uh, like many things in databases, it goes back to the 1970s, but then nobody did it for 30, 40 years uh, later. Um, so the earliest system that used this column store approach was this thing called Cantor. Um, it was more or less like a file system that looked like a database built by like, the Swedish defense systems in, like, uh, in, in the 70s. Uh, so there are remnants of, of, it, of it in the literature, but I don't think anybody even runs it still today. Um, in the 1980s, they finally came out with the sort of theoretical side of what the, the DSM, the column store approach, would look like. But it wasn't until the 1990s, as far as I know, where they actually built the, somebody built their own, the real like, first implementation of a column store system. And it was this thing called Sybase IQ. It was a memory only system, but it was sort of, it was sold as like a query accelerator like a caching system, you would have it. You would have like your regular row store system in front of it, or in the back end, and then you had this Sybase IQ in front of it, and it would it would just take copies of things in memory, put it as a column store, uh, and then you could run your queries on that. And if you ever had updated any things, you would go back and uh, you would update the uh, the back end, the the real row store database. That approach is called fraction mirrors. I think we'll cover that later when we talk about distributed systems. Um, that's that's basically how Oracle and and other systems work today. And then in the 2000s, people actually started building the, you know, some of the first uh, column store systems. Vertica was, was started by uh, my advisors, Mike, Mike Snowbreaker and Stan Zidonic. And that was like, you know, they took Postgres, forked it, ripped out the bottom half, and rewrote it as a, as a column store system. Vectorwise uh, was founded by uh, this guy, Marcin Zikowski, and, and his advisor. And then Marcin went and was a co founder of Snowflake. So a lot of the ideas, the early common source stuff that was in Vectorwise is in Snowflake today. And then MoDB is, as a, was an academic system, but is open source out of, out of, uh, out of, uh, out of, the, out of the Netherlands. And actually the guy that, that was the founder of, of MoDB, he had died a few months ago. Um, but now by the 2010s, 2020s, this is like super com like co common. Any much, any, and pretty much anybody today, if you're saying you're building a, an OLAP system or data warehouse or a you know, high performance uh, you know, analytical system, it, it, ha it has to be a column store because the, the benefits are so significant. Yes? Uh, is there any particular reason why it took so long for this to become 
So this question is, is there any particular reason why it took so long? So this is my, this is my, my, my conjecture or speculation. The, it's because of the internet. Because before the internet, there was a small, really only a small number of, of like companies that had like large data sets, right? The bank, sure. Uh, and then, you know, the, the, I'm not saying there wasn't analytical systems before. There was things called, there was like this thing called Teradata, which is very expensive. Like there was, and then there's this other approach um, to doing a, a sort of modeling analytical workloads or, analytical, or databases for analytical workloads called data cubes, which I don't, I think the textbook might cover. Nobody uses them anymore. But like, think of like, you, you, you have the queries ahead of time and you, you pre, pre execute them and store it as almost like a multi dimensional array. And you run analytics on that, right? And so, but those things would get like, you would have a batch job every night, a cron job. Every night you would update the cube for the next day, right? And so nobody could do sort of things in real time. You could only do things on whatever got refreshed the night before. And so, when the internet comes along, people want to have a lot more data. A lot more people have a lot more data, and people want to start doing this in more immediately. Then, then like the columns sort of stuff, like, oh yeah, this is a good idea. We should we should do this again. Uh, Mike told me, uh, um, Stonebreaker told me that like, he was at like Walmart Labs in the two thousands, and they were struggling to like scale with ter uh, Teradata, which is a row storage system you do analytics on, uh, that would use data cubes. And that's where he got like, oh yeah, this is stupid. We, we, we just do column stores. So that's why he went off and did, and did C store and did Vertica. All right. So any questions about column stores or row stores? Again, if you're building a, a analytical system today or choosing an analytical system, I can't imagine there is one that's not a column store. But if, if it's not a column store, it's a bad idea. But now you can see why this is like the HTAP stuff is kind of challenging because Postgres is great. Postgres has a lot of good good. Uh, optimizations for doing OLAP style queries, but at the end of the day, it's going to be a row store. And so you're not going to get the, the performance benefits that you can in the column store. Yes? Can I, can I, can I do like a strongman idea of like, why don't you just like do two, like why don't you have like a, a database system, but you do two storage formats? The statement is, uh, why don't you just have a data system that has two storage formats? And then I just insert to both, and then do some, like, you fix, you know, you so, so, yeah, so we say you insert to both, and then you just, depending, the query shows up, and you figure out where you want to do the row store or the column store. That's sort of what the, this, Fractured mirror Sybase IQ thing does. That's basically how Oracle does now, right? You can buy their Oracle in memory column, whatever, it has some stupid name. But like, you, your insert, your update query shows up, those always go to the row store. And then in the back end, they propagate the change to the column store. So then when your query shows up, uh, you would, it would say, okay, well, is this something I can run on the, on the column store? And they would just reroute it there. And then sometimes the data you need is in the column store, and sometimes it's in the row store. They can sort of natively just split it up for you and then stitch it back together to, produce, to, look, to look as if it came from a single database. They'll do that for you, and it's very expensive. Yes? Isn't that unnecessarily doubling and tripling the amount of memory you use? So he says, isn't that unnecessarily doubling and tripling the amount of memory that you use? Uh, if you're already using Oracle, you have a lot of money. <laughs> as is, as is, or, I mean, I, exit data is, I think, starting is like at least a million dollars, $2 million a year. A year for the database system for, for like Oracle Exa data. A oh, database is big money. It's like the mark the market is huge, right? Uh, Snowflake went IPO uh, a few years ago. Uh, they're down now because the stock market's a mess. But um, is okay, I don't. I'm not trying to pick an Oracle. Like maybe I am. Uh, he owns his own Hawaiian island. So the founder of Oracle, uh, he's like the sixth or seventh richest man in the world, Larry Ellison. He owns a Hawaiian island. It's paid for by databases, right? There's a lot of money in this stuff. It's a, it's a Lanai. Look at look on the map. He, he owns he owns 99% of it. There's like there's like 10 houses on it. He doesn't own. He owns the rest. Okay. All right. So uh, as we said many times, just to reiterate it. I/O is always going to be the main bottleneck uh, in the database system, right? So if we have to fetch things from disk. You know, when we looked at that, uh, that, the performance difference between the different levels of storage, going to disk is like going to Pluto, right? It's, it, it's going to take super long. Um, and so if we do have to go to disk, because our database is so big, we just don't have enough memory to store it all, uh, then we can actually have the data system compress the data uh, so that for every page we've got to bring in or write back out, we increase the utility or the amount of useful data we're actually moving along 
in, in those, in those IO operations, right? Yes, I know you can get like file systems that do native compression on themselves, right? But the database system knows better and we can do it better. So the key trade-off we're going to have to make in our decision of how we want to compress our data is going to be obviously for speed versus, versus the compression ratio, right? And in a, typically in a disk-oriented system, especially in a, in a cloud environment where you have to go to like EBS, uh, the disk is just so slow that we're willing to pay extra CPU uh, overhead to compress that data because uh, that'll, you know, that can potentially reduce the, the latency of, of getting, getting all the data we need for a particular query. In some cases, too, if we do our compression natively, and I'll explain what that is in a second, uh, we can actually also, de we can actually, even though we're paying the penalty to maybe decompress it when we bring it in, if our query engine or our database system can operate natively on compressed data, then that's going to reduce actually the CPU costs for doing query execution as well. So not only are we, are we going to reduce the amount of I.O. we have to do, we can also potentially reduce the amount of CPU work we have to do to run queries. And why can we do this? Why do you think, why do you think databases can get great compression in, you know, in data, in real-world data? Yes? He says it's a very, very well-defined structure, yes, but I already switched the answer, right? It's well-defined structure and highly skewed, meaning there's going to be a lot of repeated values over and over again, and we can take advantage of that in how we design our, our, our compression scheme in our system. So the most common example that I always like to use is this, this, this thing called the Zithian distribution. Think of it like a power law. And this was devised, or this was found in the, this project at Brown University called the Brown Corpus. Where they just looked at the, uh, they they looked at what they considered to be the 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 classic text in the English language, like Shakespeare and so forth, and they literally just went through every book and just counted the occurrence of every single word, right? And what was the most common word? B. B. T H E. Yes, right. And so that appeared so many times. And what's the second most common word? A. a. Yes, right. But the the letter the word A appeared. Uh, sorry, the word the since that appeared most, it appeared twice as many times as, as the, the letter, the word A. And then the third one, so then A appeared twice as many times as the next one, right? It's, it's this exponential distribution. So we can exploit that, and a lot of real world data is gonna look like that, right? Just think of like in the US, there's more people living in the New York City zip code than there's living in, the, in Montana. So if you have a bunch of addresses, it's gonna be more people in, obviously in New York, right? So that's one aspect of what we can exploit in, in our compression schemes. The other one is also going to be have a high correlation between values in different columns, right? So the most obvious one is, is, is zip code to city, right? A, a given city in the United States can only be in one zip code. So that means if you know the city, we'd also potentially know, know the zip code, right? Another one that's, that's more, uh, more nuanced is the order date to ship date. Because like the, the time you bought something on Amazon versus the, the date when they actually shipped it to you, it's going to be within, I don't know, a day, two days, three days now, right? And therefore, the, 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 the difference between the two values is actually going to be quite small. So maybe you only need to store a delta instead of the, the full timestamps, right? So the, there's going to be three goals in how we want to design a, a, a database compression scheme. So the first one is that we need to make sure that we always produce fixed length values or fixed length data segments. So and the reason why we want to do this is because we want to do the, the, we want to use the offset approach to know how to jump to columns just by looking at their offsets. So we need to have every single value within a column be the same length. For the variable length data, we talked about this before with the, the, the oversight storage, right? We can, we can just have this separate set of pages where we store you know, big blobs or big you know, binaries over there, and we just have a pointer to it. And that one will just compress with, with you know, gzip or snappy, whatever you want, yes? So he says, is what I'm describing a dictionary encoding scheme, where there's a lookup table to go look things up. That is one approach. It's the most common approach in databases, but it's not the only one. But it's the basic idea. So that's how you get away with most of the variable length ones? His question is, is that how you get away with most of the variable length ones? For strings, yes. OK, so I want to be like binary, same we'll, binary. We'll, we'll get to the other ones. Yeah, yeah. All right. Another goal uh, that we're going to have, and this is not going to be We'll talk, we can talk more about this when we talk about query execution, but it'll come up in some of the, the conversation today, is that we want to ideally post, have the data system wait as long as possible 
before it has to actually decompress the data. And that means that we want to have our, our database system be able to potentially operate directly on compressed data. Right? Th thinking, think of like you have a file, if, if you, you know, gzip it on, on, your, on your box, you know, uh, there's some tools that, like, like in, in the command line, can actually read you know, compressed zip file or compressed text files natively. Uh, and you can do lookups without having to like, uncompress it first and then do the scan. It's not exactly what I'm describing here, uh, but the high, the high level, I think, think of the same thing. So this technique is known as late materialization. You basically want to delay as long as possible the having to materialize the the original value before you you know that you would need to do to send it back to the user of the application. And then the last one is super important: is that we have to make sure we, anything we choose has to be a lossless scheme. So let me tell you the difference between lossless and lossy for compression. What's that example of a lossy scheme? No lossy scheme, you don't necessarily get the whole data back when you decompress it. Yeah, so his, his statement is uh, a lossy scheme is where if you, if you compress it with a lossy scheme and then decompress it, you're not guaranteed to get the exact value back, exact bits back, yes. What's the example of a lossy scheme? JPEG. JPEG, exactly. MP3, MP4, all that, right? So in our database compression scheme, we're going to have to choose, we're, we're going to always choose a lossless scheme. Because people aren't going to like it if you compress their data and then you, you know you come back and then it's not the same, not not what you expected, right? Doesn't seem like a big deal if you're looking at large, you know, you know, billions of users, billions of orders, and so forth. But when it comes to your bank account, you're not going to like it if you know you had hundred dollars in and it gets compressed, and you got eighty bucks coming back, you're going to be pissed, right? Round down to the nearest million. He says round down to the nearest million. Uh, there'll be other issues that can come up. <laughs> There's so many things in data systems. Uh, we'll come back to that later. We'll come back to that later. Um, so, uh, and that means that in, in our design decision, any any time you want to do something that is lossy, uh, this has to be done at the application level because the data system doesn't know that you'd be okay with losing some data, right? It's not, it's like, for some things, it's obvious. Like, instead of storing the exact values of the temperature at, at like you know at, at very precise measurements. And then doing that over time, where, where I can jump back a year from now and say, what was the temperature in this room exactly this, this time, you know, one year ago? But maybe instead I just care about what's the, what was the average temperature in this room the entire day. So I could compress that down by just doing aggregation and only store that single value. But I know it's okay as a human. The data system does not know it's okay, so therefore it won't do that for you. Yes, in the back. So this question is, why should we postpone query ex execution? Um, again, for late materialization. We'll see this in a few more slides. But basically, I think of this way. Like, if I have a, uh, say I, I have a really long string. Uh, say it's like one megabyte. But, I can, but I, it's repeated over and over again. So I'll just convert that to a dictionary code that's like 32 bits. So, set, so instead of me passing along one megabyte from, you know, in my, from my query, you know, from one step to the next as I'm processing it, I just pack, pass around that, that single value, the integer, and I don't pay that copy overhead. That's roughly the idea. So there's another question? Yes. Uh, so uh, is there an option in databases that if you want to store much media that you can keep it lossy? Or? This question is, is there, a, uh, is there an option in a database system where if you want to store multimedia, you can keep it lossy? Uh, So there are databases built that there are some databases that, that can store there are some database systems that, that can store like videos and things like that, but typically they are they're they're not they're not doing anything special for actually the, the, the video itself. They're just storing like the metadata about like it's you know the, the timestamps and, and who's in it, whatever you know, the creation times so forth, like the metadata about the file itself. Uh, most of those most of those things are also just using a relational database and is writing the, the, the video files themselves out to disks. They're not really doing any like transcoding or anything like that. Right? I might be wrong, there might be something like that. I but at the end of the day I don't think they're gonna build you know a, a new relational engine that can specifically do something special on video. You just store it as a file and and, and handle it that way. All right, so again, uh, We'll, we'll cover, uh, we won't cover uh, lossy techniques. There's another way to do approximate queries where you can like, do sample the data. It's sort of like uh, a lossy approach. Uh, 
but that's that's less common. We, we, we'll, we'll talk about that later when we talk about query execution. All right. So there's a bunch of ways we can we can compress data. Uh, the most obvious one is just compress a page or a single block, right? All the tuples are within the table, just, just run, you know, compress it and be done. Um, and then typically you see this in, in OLTP systems, and we'll see the example in MySQL next. Um, there are some systems that can do tuple level compression. So within a single tuple, I can compress that a certain way. Sorry, tuple within a page, I can compress that a certain way, and then I'll compress the, the next tuple a completely different. Um, Attribute level would be like if I have a single uh, single attribute that has a single value, I could put that as like in my overflow page and, and then run gzip on that to compress that separately. Uh, and then the columnar compression is you take all the values within a column and you compress them. Again, so let's talk about the, the, the this sort of first approach here. We'll see why it doesn't work for all the stuff we want to do, especially in a column store system. And, and then we'll come back to the columnar storage. And this is where you can again have the native integration or native uh, the system can natively operate directly on compressed data. All right, so with naive compression uh, at the block level, the, the database system is going to run whatever off-the-shelf compression algorithm that it wants that just going to press compress the, the data. Right, so say the single page, I take the whole thing and I run gzip on it and I store that. Right, so there's a bunch of different compression algorithms you can use. Uh, the, the state-of-the-art one now is actually we consider Z standard uh, out of Facebook. Um, and what makes these compression algorithms different than like GZIP, for example, is that they're going to make a trade-off to have a lower compression ratio in exchange for faster compress and decompress. Right? GZIP, if you, you know, if you pass the best flag. I don't know if that's the best one anymore, but like that'll be very aggressive to compress your data, get it really down really small. But it's going to be uh, more computation expensive to compute. Yes. Did you mention earlier that like we want them to go to like a quick switch in terms of yes. like for attributes and stuff? That that's a property that all of these algorithms have. So his statement is: I said before that we want the the compressed result of our data to always be fixed length. Uh, do any of these approaches do this? No. Right. Now we'll see how we handle that in the next slide. Right, so again, there's this trade-off when you decide what, what compression algorithm you're going to want to use in your database system when you're doing this naive compression. Again, naive means that like if I compress it, the data system doesn't know, doesn't understand what the bits are of the compressed data. Like in theory, you could write something that knows how to look inside, like a like a, a Z standard compressed block, and and, and make sense of it. But as far as that, nobody does that. Right? It's, it's just not worth it. And if we're going to choose something that's going to have sort of the right trade-off between performance and uh, and compression speed. And at this point, Z standard is, is, is what uh, every modern, every newer system that's built more recently will use Z standard. Uh, Facebook is, is actively maintaining it and making it better. Um, you might still see LZ4. And then Oracle, of course, has their own proprietary thing that they patented. Snappy came out of Google, but it, the, the, the also was like much faster, but lower compression ratio. At this point, the Facebook one is the best. So let's see how we're going to handle the problem that he brought up, where I take a block of data. It might get compressed to different sizes, and how to make sure that they're actually fixed fixed length. So this is what MySQL does in in, in a, for InnoDB engine. So I want to ask you have a bunch of pages that'll be compressed, and then the the size of each page could be variable length, but it's always going to be a power of two, right? One, two, four, eight, because the default page size of, or of MySQL is sixteen kilobytes. So if you compress it down, uh, then you just round up to whatever the next power of two size it can be. So that means if I have a 1.5, if I take my, my 16 kilobyte page, I compress it, and it's 1.5 kilobytes, you just pad it up and round it up to be t 2 kilobytes. And that way, you, you know exactly how to fit, you, you can fit these things more easily uh, continuously on disk and have fewer holes. So in addition to the compressed data, they're also going to have a little buffer space at the beginning of the page to call the mod log. And this is actually the same thing, of the, the, similar to that log structure stuff we talked about last time, where if I can make, if I have to make changes to the, the data within the page, I can just compend them to the mod log without potentially having to uh, decompress the whole thing. And this is why I think that the, the textbook example where they describe the log structure storage is, is, I mean, it's, it's, I don't like the way they do it because they spend too much time talking about these merge trees. But this design of pattern of like again using log structure storage appears a bunch of different places in database systems. So it's more important to understand that other than, than the merging part. 
Right? So now when I, uh, uh, if I need to read a page, I can bring it to my buffer pool, and I'll leave it compressed uh, initially. Um, anytime I have to do an update where I don't need to look at the data inside the page, it also could be an insert, right? Because I would know how many free, free how much free space I got here. I could put it into my mod log. Like say an update query with update ta update of table uh, set value equals foo. Uh, since that update doesn't doesn't need to know what the previous value was, if I know that that tuple exists in this page, I just append the log entry to to the mod log, right? And now anytime a query comes along and, it's, and it wants to get what the current value of for that attribute is. I could potentially get it from the mod log without having to decompress it. If I do need to get the full tuple back, uh, they'll actually decompress it. And then there's always blown up to 16 kilobytes in, in, in MySQL. Uh, and they actually maintain two copies of this. Right? And if the if the if I never update the page, then at some point I'll uh, I want to evict this, this page, but I can still keep the compressed one in memory. And that way it avoids having to go back to just go, go, go get it later. If the mod log gets full, then I have to then uh, apply the change and then you know write it back out. Uh, but yeah, and that, that, that you, you basically would evict this first before you evict the other one. Question? Yeah, so it goes, you said it goes up to 16K. Is that because they never compress anything larger than 16K, or is that because of the compression algorithm? His question is, it goes to 16, 16 kilobytes pages. Is that because they never compress anything larger than 16 kilobytes? Or is that the compression algorithm? So that's the default page size in MySQL. Okay. So the whole system is set up with this assumption that you have 16 kilobyte pages. So the idea is that like, when it gets uncompressed to 16 kilobytes, all the rest of the system doesn't need to know that, oh yeah, it came from a compressed thing rather than directly from disk. All right, so in this example, we said that the, the data, we have to decompress the data before we, I can read and modify it. This obviously limits how much the, how much data we can actually look at. Like if if we compress the entire table using gzip or z standard, then we're screwed because anytime we need to touch anything on that table, we got to decompress the whole thing. Uh, so you can typically can only do this. You you only use this approach for the off the naive compression algorithms for the uh, oversized storage and within it, like a single page. Yes. Uh, how do you know which mod log to append to? How do you, his question is how do you know what mod log to append to? Because there's some there's some index up above that says located in this page. It's just like before, Re record number and offset, or page number and offset. Sorry. All right. So ideally, we want our database system to operate on compressed data, right? And at a high level, it's going to look like this. So we have some uh, some table with, with two, two attributes, Matt and I, with fake that fake salaries. Um, and then somehow there'll be some compression algorithm that's going to have compressed data. We don't know what it is just yet. But then when our query comes along, you know, find select star from users where name equals Andy, I want to do some kind of database magic and be able to convert the constant Andy into the equivalent compressed uh, value for, for that, that constant. So now when I do my scan on the table, I don't have to decompress the compressed data. I can just use my compressed version of, of the key that I'm trying to find. Right, so that, that's essentially what we want to do here. And the, the column store stuff is going to be more, more amenable to this because, again, all the values within a single column are going to be contiguous. So we have a half an hour left to see how much we can get into this. So these are probably the, uh, the six most common compression schemes. Uh, again, the spoiler would be dictionary encoding is, is the, the most common, and that's going to handle the string problems for variable length things. But I want to talk about a bunch of the other of these. And I'm going in this order because we'll see that in some cases where, for one compression scheme, we can get even better compression by, by also using a, the, one of the previous ones we talked about. OK? All right, so the most simplest one we could do is called run length encoding. And the idea here is that we're going to reduce down the, a single value uh, that appears con, uh, over and over again in, in a column into a triplet. We just say, here's the value that, that we're storing. Here's the start position where we, we appear in this, in this column segment. Uh, and then here's the number of elements in the run. Right? Now, we're going to get way better compression if we sort the data uh, so that oh, you know, you know, all the things appear first, and then all appears, you know, the, ne the next value appears all, all again. But this gets tricky now because if you have, you, 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 whatever, however you sort one column, you have to reflect the same sort order to so that the offsets match in additional columns. 
So how to pick actually what columns you sort on is, is a, is a non-MP is complete problem. So this is like a really simple here, simple example here. We have a single table. Uh, we have, uh, have an ID column and then a sex column. For simplicity, just assume that there's two sexes. Not a joke. All right. So with run length encoding, what we can do is replace every single, uh, uh, at, at, at a given offset, we would have our triplet where we say, here's the value that we're storing, here's the offset we appear in, and then here's the number of values that appear afterwards, or a number of occurrences of this value. So you see at the very beginning, we have three, three M's. So at the very top here, we're going to say value M at offset zero, and the run is length three. All right? So now when I, when I have a, a query like this, select a new aggregation where you want to count the, the count the number of, of males and females in, in our user table, right? All I need to do now is look at you know look at look at these 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 encoded run length, run run encodings, and I can compute the count from this. All right? Yes. So how does this kind of system handle uh, a query where like if there's an additional where clause on another attribute? So his, his question is, how would I handle a a where clause in a query that touches multiple attributes? Yes. Uh, what do you mean by handle it? Like, like, you, now the offsets are no longer useful, right? Because, uh, sorry, no, now the lengths are no longer useful, right? Because you need to know. You so, need to know which ones are Andy, and then you need to know. Uh, right, so, so it's a question. So, what, so, not this query, but say I have like select star from table where uh, sex equals male and name equals Andy. Right. How would it in a column? How would you you would execute this? We're jumping way ahead here, but like the database system could figure out which column is more selective. Like, like should I? Are there more males than than Andes? Uh, yes. Uh, so then you maybe you want to go scan the the name column first because you'll get fewer attribute fewer matching ones, and then you can then use that. You would know what the offset of those matching Andes are. And he would use this information to basically find out whether the, the offsets are in, in these boundaries. Yes? So does this only work well with highly categorical data? This question is, does this only work well with highly categorical data? Yes. But again, we, we said before that it's highly skewed, so it's, it's likely, yes. So uh, in this case here, we can see that if we have you know, my really simple example, it's, it's, it's a binary column. There's only two values. Uh, I have ma fe female, male, female. So this is kind of bad because I could store this in, you know, a small number of bits, but I have this triplet where we have a bunch of run lengths of one. Right? So this is an example here. The run length of encoding is actually going to make the data bigger than, than, it, than it should have been. So the way to handle this is, as I said before, you, you sort it based on this column. Right? Now the number of triplets I need to store is two. Right now, you see you get amazing compression uh, if if you do the sorting. Yes. Uh, why do you have to store the length explicitly? This question is why do you have to store the length explicitly? Uh, it, well, I guess it looks like there's maybe a typo, but we don't just see the difference between. The is, yeah, his statement is: Do you have to actually store the length? Uh, it, some implications do, some implications don't, for ex explanation reasons I've, I've added there. Yes. All right, so that's one line encoding. That's very common, but it only works, as I said, again, if you have a small number of values or unique values within a column. Another approach is called, called bit packing. And the idea here is that if the data system can recognize that the values that you're storing within a given column are less than the, what the, the, the potential largest size of that column could actually be, maybe you don't need to allocate all the bits that you would normally have to allocate to store the, the same data. Right? So let's say I have a single column. It's a 64-bit integer. Uh, and so I see my values here. But what's really going underneath the covers is that I have this, you know, I have all these bits here. But in the red part is the only, the only distinguishing part of, of the values. Right? Because again, going back here, my values aren't that big, but I've said, you know, int 64. So it's 2 to the 64. I could potentially store a, a, an integer with 2 to the 64. Uh, or the largest size could be 2 to the 64, but all my values are super small. So this is all waste, wasted bits. So with bit packing, you basically can recognize that, okay, well, 
I can actually store this data in, in 8 bits or some, some smaller size, right? And so now your reduction is quite significant. So if you just, my toy example here, I have five 64 bit values. That can, is, that's 320 bits. But if I do store them as 8 bit integers, now I'm down to 40 bits. Yes? Wouldn't there come a problem with like arithmetic or aggregation for some of those have different semantics depending on bit sizes? This question is, does this become a problem with uh, aggregations and arithmetic because the semantics of integers of this size become like, So his yeah, statement is if you, well in that case like so, so that hey, sorry there are instructions like there are there are instructions to do eight bit arithmetic and to handle overflows yeah. right and so the hardware will handle some of that for you and you stitch it back together. But like but that, those but you would get a different answer than if you did it on the sixty four. One plus one if it's a sixty four bit is the same as one plus one and eight bits. Well, plus one, but, um, over there's over it'll handle the overflows. Uh, like, 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 if I have like 300, like I have like 200 and 200, and int 8, that's not 400. But I'm saying the, the data system can handle this. Okay. It, or the, har the hardware handles help, helps you as well. It'll matter, it'll also help for, for vectorization through SIMD. We'll talk about it later. All right, so this works great if all your values are exactly going to be less than, less than 8 bits or 16 bits, 32 bits, and so forth. Um, maybe the case you have outliers. Uh, and that won't work in this scheme because you're literally allocating eight bits for every single attribute, so this, this won't work. So a extension to bit packing is called mostly encoding. It's, this is what Redshift calls it in their system. And basically, you declare a column that be, hey, I'm, it's mostly going to be eight bits. But they can handle the case when it's not. So let's say I have a in 64 bit column, a 64 bit, 64 bit integer column. But I have this one guy here that, that's super big and it can't be fit in eight bits. So you can store the column, or, uh, the mostly eight, where you have all the values, again, as eight bits. But then you just have a special marker for that one guy that's an outlier. And then you have, an, and then you have a lookup table on the side that says, OK, at this offset, here's the original value. So now as I'm scanning along, doing whatever I need to do, if I come across one of the special marker, I know that, OK, I'm at this offset. Go in the lookup table to find the, the, the real value that should be there. To his point now, too, depending on what the operation, it, like if you're doing a, some kind of summation or whatever, the, the database system, in conjunction with the hardware, will know what the data type is and know how to, to cast things accordingly. All right, so the next one is called bitmap encoding. Um, and so the idea here is that if for low cardinality uh, uh, columns, meaning the, the number of distinct values is, is, is low, we're going to store now a bitmap for, that, determines, that says what, at a given offset whether the value for that attribute is 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 the given value represented by the bitmap. All right, so I'm, I'm at the ith position in the bitmap. That corresponds to the ith position or ith, ith offset in my table. And I can check to see whether the bit is flipped and it'll tell me whether the value is a given is whatever the bitmap represents. So let's go back to our example here with the sex column. Uh, so I can just take this column here and then I'll have one bitmap for males and one bitmap for females. So now if I want to say things like, you know, at this offset here, is it male or female? I could check the first bitmap of this offset, it's zero. I check this, this bit offset here, and it's one. And yes, in my example here, it's, it's only two, two sexes, so you could just, you know, zero could represent female, and one could represent male. Just think if you have more possible values. You would have a separate bitmap for each of those. Yes? Is it, same as it's, it's, ma it's mapping one possible pattern, one possible value to a, a, a bitmap, a, a vector of bits. Yes, yes. And one means that given offset, the value is this, whatever the, the bitmap represents. So my example here, again, 72 bits to store the original column, uh, but I can get it down to 16 bits plus 18 bits. Uh, it was 34 bits in, in, in the compressed version as a bitmap. Yes? His question is, is there a reason why uh, we're doing a one-hot vector as opposed to encoding the entire space as a, uh, as a, as a single number? Yeah. 
what would what, sorry, what would that single number be? Uh, so, he's, yeah, I so basically, I think that's dictionary encoding. Yeah, that, that, yes, that is dictionary encoding. Yes. Uh, yeah. But no, it's not exactly the same because you're sort of doing the offsets things, right? Like, it, your approach is basically the same thing. You could do it that way too. Yes. All right, so uh, this seems fantastic, right? Uh, but it doesn't work when you have, again, high cardinality to show you how bad it actually can get. So say we have a simple table here of just names, email addresses, and, and, and zip codes. Uh, so if you just want to build bitmap indexes on the zip codes, uh, in the US, there's about 43,000 zip codes. Assume our table has 10 million uh, records. So if you have to store a single bitmap per zip code, it's going to be 40 megabytes times 10 million is, is 53 gigs. Right? So you know, this is just going to show that like the the, you know, the bitmap, some of these compression schemes can actually make things a lot worse, and you got to be careful how to use it. Most database systems will, will require you to tell it whether you want how you want certain things compressed. What was that? All right, whatever. Uh, all right, well, I don't remember what I said. All right, we're short on time, so let me, let me keep going. Okay, because uh, there's a bunch of other stuff. So the other problem with this approach, too, is that uh, every single time I maybe add a new value or a new tuple, uh, I have to extend all these bitmaps. Uh, and every time I uh, add, a, add a new attribute, well, that's easy because you, you, you just declare a new bitmap field. It's, it's, if starting a new tuple is problematic for this. So some data systems will let you create bitmap indexes. Uh, there, are, there are some systems that they, they only store data as bitmaps like this. Uh, and there's other ways to encode databases using bitmaps as well. Um, we, we, we don't need to get into that right now. All right, delta encoding. Um, the idea here is that we're going to record the difference between values that are that follow one after another in, in a single column. Uh, and so you see, think of like an example. This it's a time series data set where every minute we're getting the temperature outside. Uh, so. For a given, uh, so, so the first value here, we'll store that in its entirety, because we always need the base value to say what our deltas will be based on or, 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 or derived from. And then for the time field, we just store like a plus one to say we're going forward in time from the previous value. And then the same thing for, for the temperature. We just have a delta from one temperature to the next. So we can actually compress this even further. Uh, and this is why I was, I was saying we can reuse some of the compression schemes you've already talked about apply it to the next compression schemes. So we see here, what do we have? Just a bunch of plus ones over and over again. So we can use the run length encoding to now store that down as, as a more simplistic ver version of this. So we say, here's the, original, here's the original time, and then we have four times after that. All right, so we just look at this, this time column here. The original value was 160 bits. The compressed version of just delta encoding gets it down to 96 bits. But if we do the, the, the RLE on top of it as well, we get down to 64 bits. I'm doing this math in bits and small examples to sort of make it more understandable. But obviously, think of tables that have billions of data or billions of records. Right? These, these are quite significant differences. We can do something similar for strings, and this is called incremental encoding. Uh, and the idea here is we just want to avoid having uh, duplicate prefixes, storing them over and over for, for consecutive tuples. All right, so we have a simple column of string data. We have rob, robbed, robbing, and robot. So we'll first start with the, 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 the common prefix here, rob. Uh, so we don't store anything there because we have it. Um, and then we go down to the next one and say, what, is the, what, is the, what portion of the previous value uh, can be found in, my, in the next string that I have? In this case here, it's this rob part. So we just keep track of these things. Go down, rob like this, robot like that. So now we know with these common prefixes, we can go back and encode the data where we can, th we can throw out the part where we know that it's, it's the same as the previous one, just store the length of the portion that's, that's the same, and then we, just, then we just store the unique suffix at the end. All right? So we prefix the suffix, and then the size, we go from 168 bits down to uh, 88 bits for the suffixes, and then 32 bits for the, the prefix information. And that's, a, what, 120 bits. Yes? Why is the prefix different for Rob and Robert? 
Why is the prefix sorry what? So the question is, why is the prefix for difference for this one versus this one? For this one and this one. Uh, because th so, th could this, so this is the prefix that, that corresponds to this, right? So in this case here, I have ROB going back here. This portion of ROBB here, it's not from the base one, it's from the one right before you. The reason why you would do it this way is because now what, if I need to jump to a given offset and I want to reconstruct the tuple, uh, I don't need to sort of replay everything from the beginning. I just look at the one that came before me. It makes that de decoding more efficient. I don't know how common this one is. Uh, there, uh, th there's something like this similar to way Postgres stores uh, information in the leaf of its B trees, but for string encoding like this, everyone does this next one, dictionary encoding. So again, most, most people think of compression, and if you know a little bit how like maybe gzip and lz4 all work, they're basically doing some variation of, 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 of dictionary encoding. The idea here is that we're going to build a separate data structure on the side that's going to map uh, unique identifiers to some kind of variable length data. And then we're going to replace the values in our column uh, with, with that identifier code rather than storing the original the original string of the original variable length data. There are some dictionary encoding schemes where you can, uh, actually, this is a good example of the difference, difference between the, the, the gzip and the LC4 naive compression schemes versus database native compression schemes. Database, the, the, the database dictionary encoding will do a whole length replacement of, of, a, of a value, meaning like I don't try to find matching or, or, or repeated patterns of byte sequences and have multiple dictionary codes for those, it's like one value equals one code. Whereas like in the, um, again, the naive compression schemes, they don't know the boundaries of, of columns or attributes. Sorry, they don't know the boundaries of, of tuples within, within a uh, you know, byte stream of column data. So they're allowed to do any, any kind of pattern replacement. The dictionary usually means like the, the single code equals a single value, if that makes sense. Like I'm not doing within the, within the value itself you know, replacing with multiple multiple codes. And as I said, this can be the most uh, widely used compression scheme in, in most database systems. All right, so say we have original data here, a bunch of string fields like this. So I'm going to compute a dictionary where I have the original value and it's going to replace it with a code like this number. Um, and then in my, my, my column now, instead of storing the string, now I store the fixed length code. All right, pretty obvious. And then it's, it handles the case we talked about at the beginning, where if my query shows up and I have a constant, I want to be able to operate directly on compressed data. Well, now I extract my constant, do my lookup in the, in the dictionary. Now I know what the code is. And then I can scan through uh, in the data. And now I'm doing comparison between on, on co the codes, which were just integers. We way faster than doing string comparisons, because right, the hardware can do this very quickly. Uh, and I don't have to decompress this column to go do my, my string match uh, that I had to define my where clause. Again, just not to keep banging on how great the, the SQL and relational uh, or declarative query language is, but like the query doesn't know, doesn't care what the hell, you know, how the data is actually compressed. The data can figure out, okay, yeah, it's compressed. Let me run this query exactly as if it was uh, or, or directly on the compressed data by rewriting the query to do this lookup based on the, the ID rather than the string. Yes. His question is, is it like hashing the original value to generate the, 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 this number? You want to take a guess? Because, like, in the event of, like, hash collision, then your hash collision, your data system will have some trouble. Yes. But what, what's another problem? You can't not go back. You say you can't go back. You can't, like, compression. Uh, wait, here, here's your answer, right? <laughs> So we need to support encode and locate. So, that, so that's my first example, where I could take the, the original string and convert it into a, in, into a, you know, a dictionary code. But then, we, as you said, we got to go back, because uh, we need to be able to potentially produce, for a dictionary code, uh, produce back into its original form. In some cases, we need to do that. The other thing that is also does support is uh, it doesn't, the, the hash function is not going to preserve the order of the of the of the, of the original values in the dictionary codes themselves, because it's, it's going to end up being random. So 
what I mean by this is that if in some cases we may want to have the for quality predicates like does something equal something, the dictionary code and his hash example would be fine. But if I want to know whether something is less than something or something greater than something, the hash again randomizes the domain, so we can't do that comparison. So a really easy trick to handle this is just to sort the strings and use that as the order of how we define our, our dictionary codes. Right? So if we take all the unique values that we have in our in our page and we just sort them and then assign codes based on, on the order that they appear, now when I want to do a comparison, like uh, you know, is, is something less than Andy or greater than Andy, uh, I can bake my decision of what the values are here, or even actually on, on the compressed values themselves. All right? So if I have something like this where name like Andy doing a wild card, uh, I can write that, rewrite that into uh, do a between calls, which is basically a range, range, range scan, because I can look at the dictionary and know that here's the only values that would match uh, my, my predicate based on the string, and these are the only this is the only range of values that I need to look at. Yes. In some cases here again that we're using like all that workload so we don't do any writes and updates. So we would have to redo all our dictionary for that. So he says uh, we're we're assuming here and yet for the columnar compression the answer is yes. We're assuming here that we're not doing OTP because if we in, in my example here, because we could insert a tuple that uh, well say we, we insert a hundred values that are in between this range here. Now all my dictionary codes are messed up because I can't guarantee that 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 sort order property I have. Yes, this won't work if you do a lot of updates and you exceed the boundary ranges. But again, OLAP like you, you the the cost of actually maintaining this dictionary too is kind of high because because basically checking this this extra data structure, doing insert, updating that like. You don't want to do this while you're doing OTP because you want to be in and out quickly in the data. So you want to do your update, do your insert, and get back right away. If you have to maintain all this sort of compressed metadata, it's going to be slow. So you wouldn't want to do it anyway. Yeah. So his, sorry, it's going back here. So what what is the usefulness of uh, being able to decode it back to its original form? Um, because there may be like some. Like you may be running, uh, you may be transforming the original data in such a way where you need to like get the original form. So my example before, I showed that the timestamps when they're trying to find people logging in from the government. I took the t took the date and then I extracted what the month was. So I could run a function on some string and I want to get like just give me the first five characters. So I have to decompress it first. Okay, uh, so let's look two two different examples of, of, of queries we could run uh, on a compressed data, on dictionary compressed data. And we see in some cases, we actually need to decompress the data or still scan the original data. In other cases, we can operate directly only on the, on the dictionary. Right? So if I query the select name from users, doing the wildcard on Andy, or A-N-D, in this case here, we still have to perform the sequential scan on the column because we uh, we need to find all the tuples that actually match my, my predicate. Right? So I still have to scan, scan the data. I can do the scan on the compressed version of it, but I still got to look at the original data. But if I'm doing distinct name, then I don't really need to know. I don't need to look at all the original tuples. I just need to know, does this thing exist, or which ones exist? So for this, for this particular query here, the data system can say, OK, well, I don't even actually need to look at the original data. I just need to look at the dictionary. And that'll produce the answer that I need. Which is great because the dictionary might be, I don't know, a couple kilobytes, right? Depending on, like, is it based on a block or a column or whatever? And the, the actual column itself could be, you know, gigabytes, terabytes. So I can produce the answer that I want by just looking at the dictionary. So again, it's this auxiliary data structure. If the data system knows how to exploit it because uh, it knows what the contents are and knows what it's actually storing, we can use it for query processing. Yes? Would the dictionary also store how many references there are to each name? Some you can do that. Uh, if you assume that the that the, the say that the block or segment of, of this for a given column, if you assume it's immutable, then yeah, you could pre-compute a bunch of these things ahead of time. So yeah. it's like if you need to support delete operations, it's actually start like doing that for itself. So like if a really long string doesn't get used, then you just gotta kick it out. That's the 
to his point, yes, same. If I if I have a really long string and it's no column actually using it, and I have to delete it, print it out. Someone's got to do the, the bookkeeping or vacuuming to clean it up, right? Yeah, someone has to do it. To me, you don't you just create a new one. And most, uh, let me think about is that true or not. Yeah, most times in OLS systems, the, the, the dictionary compressed data, the blocks are, are mutable. Right? You, so you can have, like, it doesn't necessarily need to be like log structured versus like a slider page. You just say the block is immutable. And there's a bunch of advantages you can take because of that. You don't have the optimization you can apply because of that. All right. So we're, we're over time here. Uh, so the main takeaway is this, is that you make sure that you're choosing the right storage model for whatever the target workload uh, that you're trying to support. And so this is something you, you would just figure out in the, mid, in the beginning. Like, do I want to support transactions or I want to support analytics? And you would design your system accordingly. And then the data system can get much better compression if it does it natively versus using naive. And we showed examples where you can operate directly on the compressed data. So next class, we'll talk about how the process of actually taking data from disk and bring it to memory. OK? All right, hit it. Snakes.